This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the afternoon session. Um, I'm Katia Pizzi, I'm based here at the Institute. And welcome to the session on translation and research in modern languages. We have four speakers today, and um, we're going to start with Nick Harrison from King's College. Okay, well, um, should I stand up? So I'm here from somebody behind this thing, otherwise, so hello, everyone. Um, I'm really sorry I was late. I, I had to stay myself at the hospital this morning, so oh, he's fine, but it um, wiped out the morning. Um, um, yeah, and that means I missed what's been talked about already, so I was going to make some preliminary remarks, but I think I'm going to skip those because there's a risk of me just repeating things that have been said already. So, um, I mean, the preliminary remarks are just along two lines, really, but in, in terms of things I think we in modern languages need to do. I've got these kind of two, two ideas I want to push. One idea is about pushing the idea of reading in the original and um, the benefits of reading in the original. Um, and, and something that's you know, foundational, I think, conceptually to the modern languages, disciplines, and that traditional link between languages and, and literatures, but also something I think needs to be pushed into other areas too. And for two, on two main grounds, I suppose. On the one hand, just the, the, the simple uh, question of access to that which has not been translated and will never be translated. And from that point of view, of course, it's, it's of interest to a, a vast array of, of disciplines and sub-disciplines, you know, including uh, geographers and you know, all kinds of people well outside the humanities. Um, the other, uh, on the other hand, is also the base which you can push it Coming back to that point I just made about the, the sort of the, what we see is the kind of in, inherent link between the specific language and specific cultural content, um, which gives you reasons to read in reading the original even if translation is available. Okay, so that's one set of ideas, and and, and that I think is something we need to push more um, in, in comparative literature these days, where language learning seems to be. Through, be receding for a mixture of kind of good and bad reasons, as it were, but something needs to push back there, that valorizing of reading the original. Um, but also in history, say, in theology, all kinds of areas where language learning isn't really part of programs at the moment, it seems to me should be, both undergraduate and MA and, and PhD level. The other thing I'm interested in is pushing the idea of, of translation as a form of research. And I think to some people that might seem like a contradictory uh, um, goal in light of what I just said. I, I don't think it is. Um, and I don't think I've got time today to explain all, sort of all the reasons why I don't think it's contradictory. <laughs> um, um, but I think that fundamentally valorising the kind of language skills you need to do to do translation, the kind of close attention to a text you need to do, is very much, again, deep, deeply linked to that notion of the, uh, the inherent link between a certain language and a certain culture. Okay, and so translation sort of fits into those skills in a world where we all we do all read translations. You know, we may not read them in you know I'm in French, I don't read translations of French material normally, but there are all kinds of other things I read in, in, in translation that we all read in translation. So I don't think we need to be ashamed about that, but it, it means that we do have reason to valorise translation as a practice. And so what I'm just going to talk about now is this um, sort of little campaign thing that I've got going. I've been working with other people, Ch Charles. Um, as well, a lot of other people, and this is a document then I've written and developed with the help of others um, that is currently circulating around subject associations, um, a number of which have already signed up to it. And the idea is that if, if we can get this sort of, it's going to go up on modern languages open um, with a series of endorsements from subject associations, perhaps from British Academy if I can get them on board, things like that, absolutely, you see, but certainly I'll read subject associations. Um, making it easier for us to spend research time doing translations. Okay? At the moment, there's this feeling that it's, it's a slightly risky thing to do. Is it going to be taken seriously by our managers? You know, is, it, is it safe to submit it to the ref and, and this kind of thing? There are anxieties around that. You know, just to help dispel this by having this clear statement endorsed by subject associations from which future ref panelists um, will be drawn, from which recent ref panelists have been drawn. And, um, you know, um, most, most of whom, maybe all of whom, I think, are in favour of translations research in some form or another. So I'm just going to go through this very quickly. How long are we talking? Not very long. I don't know. Okay, well, I'm going to finish under the time. So uh, uh, maybe I'll just let you. Well, maybe I'll read it out because it's too weird, otherwise, we're just standing in so, uh, so, so the first point is five points, just so you pace yourself. Translation should be treated as research by academics in and beyond modern languages and by those who facilitate, monitor, and assess their research. 
I, I did have by academic managers, but a lot of people don't like that phrase. So yeah, that's just, um, in the US, the MLA now advocates this view in matters for appointments, promotions, and tenure. So this has been going on for a little while in the states of the MLA. How successful is another question, but there is that same push. In the UK, research assessment is an additional factor. In practice, this is an argument about how we spend our time and are allowed and encouraged to spend our time as academic researchers who work in and through languages other than English and the cultures, societies, and histories associated. That's the first point. Second one, in crucial respects, this is not an argument about the meaning of the word research. In crucial respects, this is not an argument about the meaning of the word research, which has been one of the stumbling blocks of people, I think. And that, so this is, uh, in, some, in some senses, this should be a footnote, but I think it's such an important stumbling block that it's kind of in, in the manifesto. Isn't it? So in the, the MLA produced these guidelines, evaluating translations of scholarship. In those, the term is never used, the word research is never used, but there can be no doubt that the fundamental intellectual and professional issues are the same the same issues about whether this is worthwhile, whether it's a good way for people to spend their, their, their time when they're not teaching and not doing email. Um, so nor in the UK is an argument against the current definition of research in the ref, which is very broad. And crucially, it's already broad enough to include translations. People have already submitted translations successfully for the ref, and this is something that managers need to know. But there is no doubt that some members of the profession have worked on translations or who might have worked on translations have not felt confident about submitting them to the REF or have been prevented from doing so by those with administrative responsibility for submissions. In this way, our academic culture currently discourages the work of translation. Perceptions of translation and of the place of translation in the REF need to change. <coughs> Third point, and more sort of substantive points. Translation is intellectually and culturally valuable. In the words of the MLA document, translation has been an indispensable component of intellectual exchange and development throughout recorded history. The translation of a work of literature or scholarship, indeed of any major cultural document, can have a significant impact on the intellectual community, while the absence of translations impedes the circulation of ideas. The far-reaching impact of translations is one of the reasons that translation is a good use of academic time and resources. I was pleased, of course, that the word um, impact cropped up also innocently, <laughs> as it were, in the, in the MLA document, but I mean in a way that helps to kind of substantiate that, not just as some kind of artificial capture, but as a real, a real benefit of work in this area, and certainly wants to benefit for modern languages. Fourth, translation is an exacting practice at once critical and creative, and so then I pursue this with uh, terms offered by the REF, again, emphasising that the REF can, can and does already encompass this. So first, it's akin to scholarship. <coughs> Translation is always a form of scholarship. Translations require and embody high levels of specialised knowledge and scholarship, both linguistic and cultural. Or we'll do so in many cases. Of course, I, I think if you, you know, if you get a job translating the instructions for Hoover, I wouldn't expect you to submit it to the ref. So there's, there's more kind of stuff, as it were, in my footnotes that I'm pursuing elsewhere about that. But I, the, the, you know, the, the point is to assert firmly the same goes editing, I suppose, right? But, you know, if you're choosing the right materials, working on the right things, then it's, it has that value. So in this regard, translation is closely comparable to other more established forms of research, such as the production of scholarly editions. In some instances, a particular scholar will be perfectly placed to translate a particular text. Moreover, the process of translation can be expected to deepen and alter the translator scholar's own understanding of the text in ways that feed into teaching and further scholarship. And this process can produce a translation, also an interpretation, that is original, significant and rigorous. These terms in italics are all you know, key, um, key terms from the ref that contributes to the creation, development and maintenance of the intellectual infrastructure of subjects and disciplines, and that is a significant intervention in intellectual and cultural life. For second point number four, translation is a form of creative writing. This view commands wide dissent among creative writers and in academic circles, especially in the field of translation studies, itself readily embraced by the ref. Translations can be invented, original works in their own right. There's, there's something odd if you can and no problem at all submits an article in, in, under translation studies saying that translation is a form of research, but you can't actually submit, you know, so readily translation as research, that's why just trying to line that up more, more consistently. Final point, translations are no harder to assess than various other forms of research, scholarship and creative work. And this, again, obviously is kind of a, a response to some of the anxieties that are generated around around this issue. Appointment committees, ref sub-panels and so on already deal with a very wide variety of practices and outputs and it's recognised that any, you know, including buildings and pots and performances, and it's recognised that any difficulties they may pose to assessment do not constitute a good reason to inhibit the activities in question. The same unequivocal recognition needs to be extended to translation. 
In academic culture, before and far beyond Rev 2020, translation should be treated as a fully legitimate form of research. That's it. Thank you. <coughs> well, <coughs> Nick has just about said everything I was going to say. <laughs> um, you know, it seems to me that in research in modern languages, translation ought to be kind of key, uh, given that translation obviously kind of underpins all kind of cultural activity and communication. Um, and yet there is a kind of considerable suspicion about translation, both within English, the English-speaking world, within the culture, and within university disciplines, including modern language disciplines. Um, I just kind of, I, I <coughs> was working at Middlesex University in the, in, in the mid-90s, and I was working as a literary translator, and I was teaching literary translation, and the 1996 RAE came up, and uh, my translations were submitted to uh, Translations of Juan Carlos Onetti, a leading Uruguayan classic Uruguayan writer, and Juan Guti Sol, was submitted to the to the European Studies panel, and uh, they were rejected. No point. Um, <laughs> and it was kind of interesting because the guy who was head of the panel came to the Sex University to give a kind of debriefing on what, uh, on, 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 on the submission from the university in, in modern languages, and he opened his remarks by saying that. You know, Peter Bush's translation may be very good, but as far as the, the RA is concerned, you might as well put them in the rubbish bin. Um, and yet, curiously enough, um, a couple of months later, um, I received this letter from the same man saying that we're pleased to, to announce that um, your, your translation of Bangwood as well as the, 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 the Marx family saga has won the, the Ramon Mayim clan the true translation prize for this year. And uh, he, when the thing was presented, he presented the prize, gave me the check, and said, and then he said, well, Peter and I are at the forefront of uh, uh, fighting for the, <laughs> giving more visibility to literary translation within the university system. At the same time, in the same RAE, in a different university, uh, W.G. Sebald, uh, Max Sebald, um, his uh, novels, we translate uh, his novels, in written in German was submitted to the German panel. And equally they got new point. Um, they were considered not to be uh, research, not to be worthy of evaluation. Um, then I moved to uh, I moved to UEA, I was director of the British Centre of Literary Translation there, and uh, it was decided that my translations and uh, Max's work in translation should be submitted to the what was that, I think it's to 2001 RAE within creative writing in English, English and American studies. And uh, consequently, the, 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 the panel came up and gave, gave them a fine or a fine plus or something, and opened up the, the kind of comment saying that this was a great innovation and much to be praised. Um, now, uh, in the translation, I, 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 I then left, I took early retirement from the UK and went to the Barcelona. 11 years and I've just come back to live in the, in, in the UK and come back onto the Executive Committee of the Translators Association. And there was a discussion about uh, the last Executive uh, Annual General Meeting about literary translation in, in higher education. And I said, well, has, have things changed in the last 11 years? And Maureen Freely, who was the president, said, well, yes, I mean, my, my translations of all have panel of Turkish writers go, are, are assessed by the, by the ref, but, you know, there is, uh, th through creative writing, not through modern languages. And uh, last September, I went to a conference in, in, in Oxford or was on, on translation. And uh, some very good speakers from Oxford, literary translators and academics, translator, translators that did, with the new Bertolt Brecht project, and um, uh, Oliver Reddy, the translator of the new translation of Crime and Punishment. And both of them, you know, and, and Oliver said, well, uh, I mean, in conversation afterwards, he had been advised by the university not to submit this his brilliant new translation of Crime and Punishment with a very, very academic, learned scholarly introduction and it, it, equally pages of, of, of learned notes. He'd been advised not to submit his, uh, his translation as part of the ref submission from, from, from Oxford. 
Um, so I think that there is kind of a lot of, a lot of work to do. And I think that um, there's another issue here, which is research and practice. Because obviously, literary translation is a practice. It's research that is practice. Um, it is different from all the other research that, we've been, that you were talking about this morning, in that all that research is replicated, it's, it's kind of done in academic discourse. And a, and a, and a translation is not um, written in academic discourse. So it's not only a question of um, a, a, a literary translation being a scholarly product, it is also a scholarly product that has to stand, or at least strive to stand in its creativity, but the level of the original. So it's, you know, it has that kind of added value to thought in terms of, of being estimated. It, there's also another aspect to, to it, is that literary translations, or translations of philosophy, or tra translations of whatever, I, I mean, I'm a literary translator, so I'm focusing on that, but all of these, all of these translations um, bring what we hold most dear out into that big wide world for readers, and not just scholarly readers. So it is something that is a real interface with with the general society, if you like. And in terms of literary translation, there's been a, a kind of real change in the perception of literary translation in the English-speaking world, not only at the level of kind of MLA statements in, in, in the US and, and, and this manifesto, but also in terms of public perceptions of literary translation. I'll give, I'll give you an example. Um, for the last, uh, I think it's five years, at the London Book Fair, there's been a literary translation centre. There is a pen centre and there is a literary translation centre. That literary translation centre has kind of events, talks on literary translation from 10 o'clock in the morning until 5 o'clock in the afternoon for the four days of the London Book Fair. It's packed, standing room, standing room, room, room only. This year, 1,100 people attended those sessions at the London Book Fair. Coming up is the Edinburgh, the, you know, the Edinburgh Festival in the, in, the, in, in the summer, and there are over 800 events at the, at the Edinburgh Festival that have to do with literary translation. You know, translation slams, uh, talks by transla tra translators, um, games by translators. You know, um, even I would say that if you look, if you look at what's happening now on television in in in, in, in the UK, there's now much more uh, um, many more series and programmes in uh, foreign languages or modern languages on the television with subtitles. Something that kind of disappeared. In the, in, in the early 90s by, by fiat from the producers, from the, from the executives of television, like in Channel 4, who said there was too much foreign languages on, on Channel 4. That's changed now. And there is, we now see a series of that, you know, Danish or French or, or German or whatever on, 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 on main, main, mainstream television. Um, sorry, how much time? Three minutes, right. I just want to say that I've been living in Catalonia for for the last 11 years in Barcelona, and I have tra translated 15 works from Catalan over the last, uh, over the last uh, <coughs> nine years. And I would say that I would also warn against this idea of, you know, kind of over the idea of specialization. I was never, I've never been a Catalan specialist, but I've, I've now become the, 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 the most prolific translator of, of Catalan. And I've translated three classic works from Catalan by a writer called Josep Pla and another called Joan Salas and, and, and Mesa Rubirena, in fact. And these, the, the, the impact of these translations has been that they've had good reviews in the UK and the US, and this has had an impact back, back in Catalonia, in the sense that the, the, the uh, Uncertain Glory by Joan Salas has now, I mean, the, the sales of, of the original work in Catalan have gone up in, tremendously as a result of the impact of news about the translation in the English-speaking world, you know, it's kind of nominated by the Economist as one of the best ten books for uh, 2014. Now, um, what I'm saying is that the translations can have an impact in surprising ways that are kind of can be that are and one cannot necessarily anticipate. And they also have kind of, you know, it, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a historist uh, by by training and. and tra Doing these translations raised other issues for me in terms of scholarship, and I think that um, uh, this is where the practice of translation can kind of give you new, new insights into into scholarship. And I realised, you know, why is it that people who read Spanish literature 
don't know about these works. You'd expect, or, 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 or even people who, who are scholars in European, European literature, why they don't know about these works. You'd expect, if you were a, a, a scholar of uh, contemporary art, you would expect, of European art, you expect people to know about Miro, Dali, uh, Picasso, and so on. Um, but of course, these works have to be translated. There's, a, there's, a, there's, this, la there's this language issue. And these translations that are now in English, can have a, an impact that, I mean, it's made me rethink my ideas as a scholar of Spanish, of Spanish literature, really, and of Latin American literature as well. Because here you have a small country in, 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 the, heart of Europe, in, in the heart of Europe, and its literary culture is basically being invisible, um, apart, unless you could read Catalan. And the Catalan specialists have not been able to bring that into a broader arena. And it can only be done by 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 by, by, tran by translation. So I think that um, I, I mean I think this this, this manifesto is, is fantastic, but I think it's going to be very kind of hard, hard. There are a lot of hard battles to to kind of implement it in terms of institutions. Um, <coughs> I would also say that I would hope that um, in relation to this idea of research and practice. That there's been a big uh, development of translation studies in the modern knowledge context in, in British universities and American universities to, to a lesser extent. But I think that it's, you know, well, I would hope that with, within the future there will be, um, as well as profession, professors of translation studies, there will be professors of literary translation or professors of translation who were active translators. In the sense that, you know, there's been a real boom. In, 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 in English studies, in terms of creative writing, there's no university without a professor of creative writing. And they would never appoint a professor of creative writing who didn't have a track record as a, um, a, 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 as a writer. And I think that there, there, there need to be posts in, in, in the UK and in, in the US of professors of translation who are, um, who, who are professionals, who know, who know the industry, who know the business, and um, have um, that edge on their relationship to the to the scholarship. Okay, I'll stop there. <laughs>
which uh, they had been unable to tie up in a threatening gesture, which was nonetheless terrible for being partial, howling unknown spells and violently thrusting his torso forward. The bones fell off and the body of the Negro rose in the air, flying until it plunged into the black wave of the sea of slaves. A single cry filled the, squ the square, my candle saved. Pandemonium followed. The guards fell with rifle butts and the howling blacks, who now seemed to overflow the street, climbing toward the window. And the noise and screaming and uproar were such that the very few saw that Macandro, held by ten soldiers, had been thrust headfirst into the fire, and that a flame fed by his burning hair had drowned his last cry. When the slaves were restored to order, the fire was burning normally like any fire of good wood, and the breeze blowing from the sea was lifting the smoke toward the windows, where more than one lady who had fainted had recovered consciousness. There was no longer anything to see. The af that afternoon, the slaves returned to their plantations, laughing all the way. The second incident is about Mademoiselle Floridor, the failed actress and wife of Monsieur Le Normand de Maisy, the plantation owner. After 20 years, faded and gnawed by malaria and addled by drink, she still declaims before her captive audience the great role she had never been allowed to interpret, like Racine's Phaedra. Quotation from... Uh, I'm not going to, my whole talk isn't just reading out anything, but it's a, Wrapped in her confidant's veils, the timid player of bit parts attacked with quivering voice the familiar bravura passages, which I'm not going to read in French, but in English. My sins are heaped already to overflowing. I am seeped at once in incest and hypocrisy. My murderous hands, hot for avenging me, are fain to plunge themselves in guiltless blood. I gape with amazement, at a loss to know what it was all about, but gathering from certain words that in Creole too referred to misdemeanours whose punishment ranged from a thrashing to having one's head chopped off, the Negroes came to the conclusion that the lady must have committed many crimes in days gone by and that she was probably in the colony to get away from the police of Paris like so many of the prostitutes in the camp who had unsettled accounts with the metropolis. The word crime was similar, to the, in the, uh, was similar in the island Patois. Everybody knew what judges were called in French and as for hell and red devils, they had been vividly described by the second wife of Monsieur Le Normand de Missy, a crim set censor of all sins of the flesh. Nothing that this woman, wearing a white robe that was transparent in the torchlight, was confessing was of an edifying nature. Both of these instances speak to me of the same thing, a performative act that delivers one set of meanings for the enunciator or performer and is read in radically different ways by the interlocutors. Meaning is splintered and subject to hierarchies of power and understanding. It is the vacuum of shared understanding, the dangerous, feared and fearful place of non-recognition and ignorance that is also the source of the potential for and the fear of revolution, rebellion, subversion, invasion and the destruction of imposed post order or for the modelling of order on previous regimes as was happening in Haiti at the time. For me, the heart of modern languages research is in the recognition and understanding of the historical reality of these spaces where acts of translation have been founded on inquiry, on mistakes, misunderstanding, willful unknowing and the inability to know what is not known. Doris Summer says, and many people say this, but it's a nice quotation from Doris Summer, Words do work in the world, whether we intend it, approve it, or not. The challenge is to take that it work into account. This is what translation teaches us, embeds deep in our bodies. And this is precisely what students of languages, I mean, I'm talking about the European uh, pupils rather in schools, are not taught when they start learning. That as soon as they can say a sentence, they're creating meaning. Their words are audible to and interpretable by others caught increasingly in the machinery of the production of an academic elite, pupils are not apprenticed into a world that recognises language learning as play, as risk-taking, as failure and as experiment and as action. As something, language learning is something that they know, that they have mastered and that they are familiar with. Which goes back to the talk about um, multilingualism and what the students have in their bodies. Rather, they are taught that languages are places where they will find academic failure and that will block their pathway into the world that awaits them. 
when we, as scholars and practitioners, seek to convince others that languages open the world to us, how do we get beyond that first taught and assimilated obstacle which we have helped to create? I'm with Doris Summer when she says that's capitulating to dominant ideologies of usefulness to which languages and humanity scholars have contributed threaten the foundations of a free society. She says, a disposition towards creativity and critique resists authoritarian single-mindedness. It acknowledges different points of view and multiple ways to arrange available material. Constitutional democracies are themselves collective, collective works of art accountable for their constructions. The potential of translation is to recognize the place of the individual, of the body, in the movement and traffic of ideas and ideologies. There is always someone there, people creating the market, people making the internet a world-changing place, people deciding what we teach and how. Translation offers agency in these processes. It helps to stop a them and us mentality that removes the individual from responsibility. But the crossings it forces on the translator test our place of origin and our certainties and beliefs, our ethics and morals. In modern, languages, scholar, in modern language scholars, we are, we should be, creating highly skilled people who have the ability to perceive that different things are happening in the same place and at the same time, McCandle and Mademoiselle Floridor, for example. And scholars who have the ability to begin to read, analyse, transmit and communicate as clear-sightedly as possible for the sake of all. For example, the terrorist attacks on Tunisia have awakened the fear that the country will be increasingly close to what is beyond its borders, making it vulnerable to authoritarian ideologies. Are we colluding in that process? Translation is historically a measure of openness to the world. The <coughs> command of the modes of travelling in between places and times is fundamental, life-changing and world-changing. The thing is to know how. Not everyone is a translator, not all modern languages scholars can be, wants to be, or should, and I emphasise that, be translators. The thing is to know how, to know the questions to ask, to know how to recognise gaps, to know how to activate knowledge, to develop it, to make it act in the world through the languages we command and through the scholarship in which we in modern languages, um, in which we engage in modern languages, to know, to name, to use and to disseminate our skills. This is to engage in the hermeneutic acts that being a traveller across and between languages and cultures in entails, recognising that words always act, they always do, they've made our world, and we desperately need people who are agents of complex, of thick understanding and exchange. Last but not least, uh, Loredana Coletti from the University of Warwick. Okay, um, right. Take my timing. Um, so let me start, I think, by um, situating myself I'm, because I'm a complicated person. So, um, yes, at Warwick University, as Katia just said, but soon to move to Cardiff University and in Italian studies, uh, but soon to move to translation studies formally. And yet, across all of these things very firmly, I feel within modern languages and within modern languages in a way that we are articulating here today, and I want to say a little bit more about that. Also, speaking here, as Charles um, Bollet did this morning, um, I'm speaking as an I, but also partly as a we, because I'm part of the, the translation, Transnationalizing Modern Languages project, and I think a lot of what we're saying is something that We've been trying to elaborate within the project, but also with, with people collaborating with the project, such as Ben and Erica Kings and others who are working with us very much to try and, and formulate what are very complicated ideas. So, having said all this, and taking a clue to the people who come before me, in the sense Nick and Peter in particular have been talking about how translation is research. I suppose I subscribe to that, but I also want to talk about how research <coughs> in modern languages is very much translation. Um, uh, Catherine this morning was, was challenging us to come up with a short definition. I'll give you my pennyworth of wisdom on this. I think if I had to come up with a, def with a short definition, I would say that research in modern languages is research that acknowledges the mobility and the permeability of cultures and that tackles uh, the connection, the relationship between uh, languages, textualities and cultures. And if you take it that way, then 
clearly the specificity of linguists, the specificity of modern linguists, again, I don't know whether we need that label there, but modern there, but specificity of linguists is not that they are particularly good in any one language, is the fact that they're capable of moving between languages. That's what we do best. I keep saying that there are plenty of people who speak German perfectly, they're German. There are plenty of people who speak Italian perfectly, they're Italian. What we do as linguists is we have that ability to move between languages, and we should never forget that. So in that sense, in that respect, researchers in modern languages are translators, are translators also in the sense of mediation of all the things that have been mentioned already by colleagues today. And I always think of translation as a continuum. Uh, so you have translation in the strictest sense, and if you want the Jakobsen definition, you know, translation strict to sense the translation from the between one language and another, interlingual translation, and you may be very literal about that. But then you go through all this, a whole series of broadenings of that uh, term, hopefully without losing entire sense, without losing meaning, but without dilute, diluting it too much. But you certainly can go through, you know, from literal translation to freer forms of translation to adaptation, and of course over the centuries, things that have had negative um, uh, labels attached to them, such as, such as polarization, for instance. And yet, today, research is also re looking again at polarization and looking at what the Reverend Bowler and allegedly, mostly his sister actually, were doing when they were polarizing texts. Um, so I think on that continuum, um, Modern languages researchers are very much operating a whole series of processes of, uh, of translation. And there's a, um, an Italian semiotician I, I often quote, his name is Paolo Fabri, and he has these, he has these amazing images about translators. Uh, one of them is that translators are like bumblebees. If you look at the physics of their bodies and the span of their wings and all the rest, they shouldn't fly, and yet they do it all the time. And in a sense, translation we know, we know is an impossible um, uh, task in a sense, and yet it's one that permeates all of our lives, permeates our environment constantly, and by which we live um, all of the time. But the other image that I think about and I think of how the family goes very much back to what um, Charles Fawcett was saying this morning about our ethnographic imperative and privilege. And what Paolo Fabri says is translators are double agents, they are apostates. They are traitors in the old translator traitor sense, but they do that consciously because they are the ones who know that the impermeability of cultures, the self-containedness of cultures, in the sense in which we've uh, seen that constructed, especially during the age of nationalism, is a made-up story. And so translators consciously break through those barriers because that's the way to actually do cultures in and culture. In, in a much more productive way. So I think, in, in, as I was saying, in, in that sense, I think translators are working on that continuum. And by the way, I also the other thing that I keep talking about um, is I, I've got this thing I call the ping pong theory of translation, which is very much what Catherine was talking about. The best translations are translations that don't stay put. And Peter was talking about this as well. You know, translations that produce unexpected results, are translations that ping pong back to the culture of origin of maybe a text or go somewhere else altogether, but continue to be productive. And if you think of the history of culture, taking away those processes, you would basically destroy the whole um, history of, of how cultures have developed. Without that form of translation, that creative form of translation, this would not happen. So I think in, in many ways, uh, what I'm talking about is the porosity of cultures, and I think that modern languages researchers are very much working in that area, and in that sense translation is one of the best intellectual hermeneutic models that we can possibly think of and operate with. Um, in that respect, um, for years, again, looking at my background, uh, I, I worked for years in, in the area of travel and travel writing and in the area of translation, and people used to say to me, oh, yeah, such disparate fields, how do you keep them together? And in my head, they were always so connected. And then sort of mobility studies emerged, and people started saying, oh yeah, of course, it's about mobility, isn't it? And there's a sense in which now I've moved to the next uh, conundrum to me, and the reason, we're working in particular with the TML project, and also with the other two large projects under the Translating Culture theme, the thing that keeps hitting me is, why do we keep translation studies research and multilingualism research in separate areas. It makes no sense to me. 
We should be working together on these things. And again, modern language scholars are the ones that should be doing this in collaboration with, with colleagues in, in, in other disciplines. So I'm thinking about this connection, modern languages, translation studies, multilingualism. And then along that continuum, again, I'm thinking of all the work that's being done um, in uh, cul cultural and inter intercultural literacy and in intercultural and cultural intelligence. And again, how we as modern languages um, scholars are missing a huge opportunity, Nicola was talking about this this morning, in not intervening in these fields more openly. I mean, Nicola and, and my colleague who are working with the project did very much so, but I think we need, we need to do that more. So if we think about it this way, then I think it's very clear also that modern languages research is about forms of engagement which are, are local, are very much local, but are also very much global. Um, and, and maintaining those national barriers then makes very little sense. And this is something that the Transnationalizing Modern Languages Project is, is attempting to do. And we're doing it from inside one of the disciplines, yes, from inside Italian studies, but as I was trying to say this morning, precisely to try and break free of, of those boundaries. Um, and I think if we're thinking about it that way, then also our agendas should be clear and one of the things that we should be doing very, very strongly at national and at European level and possibly beyond that is to make sure that we talk about cultural literacy and language literacy and translation literacy in the sense that we're talking about as one of the societal challenges uh, that should be at the top of any research and um, social indeed, agenda. So to finish, Four very quick points, which are practical points for me, but which I think we need to tackle if we want to go somewhere uh, towards this kind of reconceptualization of modern languages research. The first one, and it's another elephant in the room, uh, Catherine mentioned one in the morning, is the division of labor. Until we are brave enough to tackle what we do in terms of the division of labor in modern languages, in terms of who teaches language and who teaches some, I mean, whatever else, and how those careers are professionalized, and how the research in those areas uh, are, you know, it, it, the research in those areas is uh, sort of um, perceived and, and measured. Again, something that Nicola was talking about. Until we have areas of applied language studies, for instance, within modern languages, which are perceived as vital to what we're doing, then I don't think we can solve these tensions. Internationally, I think we also need to really think carefully about who our interlocutors are. I was listening very carefully this morning about the question, you know, yeah, what's the tension between you know, what we do in French studies here and what my colleagues do in France? Well, my interlocutors are not, and I'm prepared to say it here, no problem, they're not Italianists in Italy. They have never been. I have no contact with any of them, with possibly one or two very odd exceptions. My interlocutors are people in all kinds of other areas, but what Italianists in Italy traditionally, and they are changing, but traditionally don't do, is moving between cultures. And as a linguist, that's what I do. So that comparative, contrastive, whatever you want to call it, element, is the distinctive thing that I do. And the, you know, I don't hate them, I, don't take me wrong, but I, I have nothing, I have very little in common with Italians in Italy. And I think that if Italian studies in the UK, Italian studies in France, Italian studies in South America constructed itself as a repetition of Italian studies in Italy, then it would be a disaster. And I don't understand the intellectual enterprise of that. It's not just a practical thing to talking about. Um, the, the third point, and I'm almost finished, is sustaining translation, indeed. And one of the paradoxes, and this is very much what Peter was talking about, when I look at Italian, and I don't always take against Italian colleagues, one of the things that happens in Italy is that because translation is recognized traditionally as an academic enterprise, the collaboration between publishers and academics is very, very strong. And when I look at modern languages colleagues in Italy, a large part of what they do is work with publishers, with large publishers, with small publishers, into a new editions, learned editions, translations, that is a large part of what they do. And when we complain about the fact that there's not enough translation in, in the Anglophone world, well, if we as modern languages specialists are not doing that mediating role, and if we're not working with the publishing industry, well, who else can do it? And I know this is a catch-22 thing, because if it's not, so yes, please, so if it's not recognized as research, we cannot do it. And we're not, we're not sort of incentivized to do it. But if we don't do it, then translation will not grow as, uh, as in terms of its reading, publishing, publish, uh, sorry, uh, public. 
And I think publishers would, I suspect, very much like to work more closely with us, but there is, there is a barrier there. And the very, very last point is, <clears throat> I think I would again very much welcome um, the fact, you know, having professors of translation who are actually translators. In fact, I'm very fortunate I've been working for the past few years very, very closely with one of the best translators, uh, Maureen Freely, and who, who is, of course, professor of creative writing in Warwick, not professor of translation, but very much working in translation and creative writing. But the conclusion of many a drunken evening with Maureen has been <laughs> that we need to work together, and, and that's actually led us to teach this year for the first time, and it's been an immense pleasure, um, a course, an MA course, which is bringing together translation theory and translation practice. Because otherwise, again, yeah, there is a tension there, and it's an unresolved tension, where very often practitioners of translation, not Peter, but practitioners of translation will say, oh no, yeah, I don't do theory, these people don't analyze it to death, and I, I don't do that. And then translation studies scholars, very often are people who don't really work as translators. So bringing those two things together is something that we need to do. Right.